One, it is good for us to be here once again, gathered in this place. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I just want to know this uh, afternoon, are you glad? Are you glad? Yeah, glad to be here. With that in mind, we say welcome to everyone uh, in this gathering. Those that are tuned in by way of social media, we say welcome to you as well. And we say uh, this afternoon, as Bishop Gwynn brings the word of uh, truth to us by way of teaching, we just want to say let us just lift up our, our hearts to the heavens this afternoon that uh, God will meet us there and that a blessing will be poured out, that the windows of heaven are open right now. With that in mind, let us pray. Our Father, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus, Lord, we do love you. And Lord, we stand, Father, right now, Father, just like an uh, 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 empty pitcher, Father, beneath the ever-flowing uh, fountain, dear Lord, in which, Father, we can be filled, Father, from the windows of heaven, dear Lord, with your richness, with your glory, and, Father, with the blessing that we stand in need of. Bless Bishop Gwynn this afternoon, Father, as he brings forth the uh, uh, word of life, Father, and he breaks that bread that we all can be fed on this afternoon, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord for our senior assistant, Pastor James Harden. Thank the Lord for all of you that are here today. It is a beautiful day. It is the day the Lord has made, and we rejoice, and we're glad, and we're glad, and Amen. we're glad to be Amen. part of this great and glorious, glorious day. I thank the Lord for Deacon Bolden. He's working on it very seriously, and we are having some super interesting experiences with technology, but that is technology, isn't it? Amen. In the name of Jesus. We're going to do the best we can, as quickly as we can, and we're just going to have a good time in the name of Jesus. I'm here. You're here. The Holy Spirit is here. We got the Word of God here. We're just going to enjoy ourselves in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's see where the Lord is going to take us and how he's going to bless us today. Uh, Sunday, Minister Julius Freeman, he was our speaker, and he did a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous job. Did he not do a fabulous job? His subject title was Stand Strong. It came from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, and I am just going to read it. I don't know what's above my head, but whatever it is, we're going to enjoy the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter, 10, uh, chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggles, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil, in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full arm of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with, for, with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Mm -hmm. Take the helmet of salvation yeah. and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. It is so, it is settled in the name of Jesus. Now, Minister Freeman began with background information on the city of Ephesus and the believers who lived there who were called Ephesians. Let me start by saying Ephesians, uh, the book of Ephesians, was one of the four letters written by Paul while under house arrest in Rome. Uh, he did have some time when he was on lockdown. And on lockdown, you want to make the very best that, of the time that you have. I can say this without question. I get far more letters from folks that are on lockdown than I get from anybody else. I can say this. I get 
more calls from people that are on lockdown than from people that are free and about. When you're free and about, you got stuff to worry about. You got stuff, stuff is not going your way. You have no idea what's not going your way until you have no say so in your way. But anyway, there's Ephesians, there's Philippians, there's Colossians and Philemon. They're often called the prison epistles. In, ses in essence, he just writes them while he's on house arrest. Now, Ephesians, like the other epistles or letters, were written to address a specific need to the first century church and its believers. You see, the church was young. It was just getting started. Uh, Paul was not one that actually went with Jesus or knew Jesus or even had met Jesus. He was one that the scripture says was born out of season. The other apostles were individuals who had been with Jesus, had been taught by Jesus, had been anointed and appointed by Jesus. Paul was different from all of those. And, and as you'll see in your trivia, you're going to find out how different he was. Now, Paul's letter to the Ephesians was written during a time when the city of Ephesus was a commercial and religious center of Asia Minor. It was like Chicago or New York or Atlanta or Los Angeles or Las Vegas. It was live. It was live. Anybody here ever live in a big city? Anybody in a big city? Okay. All right. Uh, how did the city affect you? Do you have any ideas, any perspectives on how the city may have affected you? Anybody? Not okay. Go right ahead. All right, we'll start with you, and then we'll move on. Yes, sir. We did uh, live in Las Vegas before uh, coming. Well, stationed out there in the military, and uh, part of the reasoning for coming back to the Midwest was because it was too fast okay. for our kids <laughs> growing up in that type of environment. I mean, it was really fast. Yeah, yeah, fast. Somebody say fast. <laughs> yes, sir. Fast. That's fast live. Okay, we got Sister Maxie right here. Sister Bernie. I, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and raised my children in Chicago. Mm. And I grew up in the church before I knew I was in Brooklyn. <laughs> we didn't have a problem. Okay. It was our world. We followed Holy Spirit. Yeah. My children, till they went to college, and then it was different atmosphere, but they still took control. Yeah. And I see the difference now. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's a real blessing. We got Evangelist Taylor behind you right there. Yes. I was born in Arkansas. Okay. The hills of Arkansas, back up in the woods. So when I married my husband, very young age, I moved to Chicago, big city. And it was wonderful for me because to be in the bright lights and see the, all the things that Chicago had to offer. And it did pull me away from my uh, training, my background. Okay. I was born in the church. And so I soon, you know, I quickly took on the bright lights in okay. the big city. And okay. that's how the big city affected me. Okay. All yeah. right. Praise the Lord. So we see how different cities can affect. You grew up in the big city. Uh, Brooklyn is a fairly large city right outside of New York. Um, five boroughs. Yeah. So so when you're in one, you're actually in the other. Yeah. So it's, it's live all the time. New York is a city that never sleeps. Chicago, they act like they sleep, but they're not sleep. OK. I mean, it's, it's wow. It's wow. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Somebody not from Brooklyn would say New York because it's all the same. Absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. And that's a real good piece right there. When I went to the military, it's really interesting. I actually grew up in Chicago. I was born in Chicago, raised in Chicago, went to the military from Chicago. It did not matter. Anybody that came from anywhere else in Illinois or around Illinois, they came from Chicago, okay? <laughs> Just the city because it had an air to it. It made people believe that they had something going on that other folks did not have. So we see then when you're in that kind of environment, you need someone to watch you, someone to cover you, someone to encourage you and mentor you. And sometimes it's difficult when you hit a certain age and you don't want to be watched. You don't want to be mentored. You don't want anybody encouraging you. I want to do what I want to do. Anybody here ever been in a place where you wanted to do what you wanted to do? Now, now some people will say yes. 
us and some folks won't say anything, but the truth of the matter is a little part of us wanted to do what we wanted to do in one way or another. Paul was not a stranger to Ephesus. It is written that he visited the city towards the end of his second missionary journey and again on his third missionary journey. And he had spent about two years there ministering to the church and to the believers in Ephesus. So he was familiar with them. Paul's letter to the Ephesians was powerful then. But just like the message and the books and the letters that are in the scripture, they're powerful for us today. Paul was not writing to them because they had done something wrong. Paul was simply writing them to encourage them to keep doing the right thing because he knew the lights was, were there. He knew that the pull was there. He knew that the pressure was there. And many of us have, in one way or another, given in to the pressure. Thank God we're not there today, but we do know a day when we were there. Paul opens his letter in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and this is what he says. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number one, Paul identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is a messenger sent by the Lord to proclaim the gospel of the Lord. So he's sent by the Lord Jesus Christ to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle, for the most part, was beginning a ministry in an area where the ministry had never been heard of. So he had a specific calling and a specific ministry. He opens by saying, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. In other words, what he says is, I work for Jesus. I work for you. He wanted that to be very clear. Now, most of us, uh, let me give you this last part, because he then goes on to say, as God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, this is what he says, you work for him too. You work for him too. Now, here's a very interesting thing. It is almost expected that whoever is the minister, messenger of the church would identify himself or herself as a messenger of Jesus Christ. That's almost expected. What is not expected is that those that are members of the body of Jesus Christ would likewise admit that they are worshipers and followers of Jesus Christ as well. Most of the people that know us, unless they're very close to us, they don't really know who we are. Uh, can I say it maybe a little differently? They may not know whose we are because we don't identify ourselves as followers of Christ, as apostles of Christ, as servants of Jesus Christ. If you know Paul's story, then you know how different it is to hear Paul speak like that. That was not his upbringing. That was not his norm. When we first met Paul in Acts chapter 7, he is called Saul. He's called Saul. He was watching the clothes of those who stoned Stephen to death. All right. So he was on the other side. He was not on the Lord's side. He was a spectator and a participant in a mob action. In Acts, he makes havoc of the church, dragging the scripture says off men and women and throwing them into prison. Anyone who called on the name of Jesus. But in Ephesians, we find Paul arrested. And he's sitting in prison because he called on the name of Jesus. Isn't it amazing the turnaround in his life? Can I just say it for a moment? Isn't it amazing the turnaround in your life and my life as well? Amen. He's now converted and he is in prison. Paul became an outstanding representative of Jesus Christ because he had such a story about Jesus Christ that had started with him being such a terror to those who followed Jesus Christ. Question, uh, how would you describe yourself before Jesus Christ? Now, we know Sister Bernie, she just knows Jesus Christ. Anybody know yourself before Jesus? 
Any, know yourself before. Maybe you were with Jesus and then you wandered away from Jesus. Do you know yourself when you were not with Jesus? Because let me say something. I've always been with Jesus, but I've not always been with Jesus. Does that make any sense to you right there? I always knew who my Savior was. I always had, a, had an allegiance to him. But there were certain times of the day that I would think it was dark enough for me to do what I wanted to do. And maybe my Savior wouldn't see it. All right. Amen. Anybody. Okay. Somebody's got, got a story. How would you describe your life before Christ? How would you describe your life after Christ? And here's the thing right here. Was your life before Christ more exciting or is your life in Christ more exciting? Okay. I'm just playing with you. Great. Man has got a hand up. Praise the Lord. He's coming with the mic. We want to hear what you got to say in Jesus name. I have to say this, to be honest, uh -huh. my life was more exciting to my understanding. Okay, okay, right? okay, that's to my good. my understanding. To yes, your I, understanding. I, I enjoyed the bright lights in the big city. Yeah. Really exciting. But when the, when the um, mel hit the pel, pel hit the mel or whatever, <laughs> okay. when life hit, <laughs> yeah. then I recognized mm -hmm. I was empty, nothing, that I needed Jesus. And then when he came into my life, yeah. I recognized now. The fullness of his power. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Isn't that a blessing right there? Because when we deal with bright lights, there comes a time when the lights go out. That's the thing. The lights go out. Okay. And now you're left in the dark. And, and you can't find your way. You don't know where you are. You don't even know how you got there. And seemingly at that point, the whole bottom falls out. And everything now is going wrong. And you're looking for refuge. You're looking for a way out. And you don't know how to get out. And so watch this. If you had any inkling of who Jesus was and what Jesus could do in that place, you called his name. Amen. You called, Lord, if you can help me here. I never get back in this situation ever again. Right here. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Jesus went to the wedding. Jesus laughed. Jesus had friends. The bright lights are bright for everybody. The difference with me is the next morning I didn't have a hangover. Yeah. The next morning I knew what I had done. I didn't have to hide and wonder if daddy saw me come home. Yeah. I had a good time. Yeah. I just didn't have the pain that everybody else had the next morning. Yeah, that's a real good thing. Sa I, and Saturday night, I could go out. I'd yeah. be at Sunday school. I'd be early. Yeah. And she was just blessed. Hey, Amen. She was just one, of the, just one of the blessed ones. Yeah, let me say this to you. Let me say this to you. And, and we look at that. And, and, and she brought out Jesus going to the, to the wedding. He didn't go but to one wedding. He didn't go to another wedding after that. He went there for that specific purpose that his mom said that we, they've run out of wine. So he says, woman, he's not in any disrespectful way. Well, what? Well, this is not even my time. I don't even know really why, why I'm here. Well, I guess now I know why I'm here to turn this water to wine. But we're going to do that and we're getting out of here, okay? And, and he doesn't do that anymore. Now, here's the thing because we didn't brought that out. Because I used to dance too. I did not do one dance to glorify God. When I was out there, not there, not one. Talk to me, somebody. I used to drink a little bit, too. I didn't have one drink to glorify God. Am I talking to anybody here now? I'm just saying. And I thought I was pretty good. As a matter of fact, I told my wife when we got married, she didn't dance. I say, don't ever ask me to stop dancing because I'll never stop. That's how twisted I was. Somebody say twisted. But God. Somebody say, but God. Because I couldn't lead them to Christ. You, I, and I think I've shared the story with you before. I was dancing with this young lady, and I, my dad was sick, and I'm trying to make a deal with God to heal my dad, and I'll preach. Because I told him I wasn't going to preach because I wasn't living the life of a preacher. So I said, okay, I'm going to preach if you heal my dad. Didn't get that at all. He didn't say, no, no, that's not going to happen. But while I'm dancing, my cousins are saying, you know, Pancho's preaching. That's my nickname, Pancho's preaching. Pancho's preaching. Pancho's preaching. And we're dancing, and she said to me, where do you preach? Because I want to go to the church where you preach. And I never danced another time after that because I knew I was leading people in the wrong direction. I already knew better, and I shouldn't have been out there. Can I get three people to say, say amen? amen? Amen. Now, watch this. Okay. I don't even want to tell you, man. I'm, I'm going to just tell you this. I'm going to just tell you this here. I was in the church in the basement. 
and we were partying in the church, in the basement, in the house of God, in the basement, doing things that were ungodly in the basement. And listen, I was not only in the basement physically, but I was in the basement spiritually as well. Amen. Somebody say, come out of the basement. Come on out of the basement. Come on up. Rise up. Get up. There's a brighter day ahead. Amen. 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 So watch this. So Paul comes with number one. It's the grace of God. The reason we're here today is because of the grace of God. I, I listen to Sister uh, Bernie. I'm telling you right now, it was some wolves after you. I can tell. I can look at you and tell there was some wolves. God just covered you. God just protected you. It's the grace of God. Somebody say grace. Grace, grace is unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. Yes, That's what it is. It is a gift from God. Look at how Paul says it in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Mm. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved yeah. through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. He wants the Ephesians to know that the only reason you are who you are and you can do what you can do is because of the grace of God, because of the favor of God or the gift of God. Okay, so now watch this. Here's a question. Have you ever felt better than someone else because you're saved? I'm not looking for a pat answer. I'm just looking for a real answer. Have you ever felt better than somebody else because you're saved? Okay. All right. Do you think that other people have felt better than you because they feel more saved than you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's been on both sides. I felt better than that I was better than them because I'm saved and they still doing drugs and, and they still running around and they're still doing their thing so I know I'm better than them and then you find someone else that says the Lord our God declared and they and then you start looking at them like they're better than me okay I'm just being real talk go ahead say yeah, I, I, I was trying to hold it Help yourself. I, because my stuff is so Traumatic, you know. It's okay. But anyway, in the church, though. Yeah. While I was in the church, I, I was, you remember when I first met you, Bishop, I told you I couldn't be a minister in this church because yeah. I smoked cigarettes. Yeah, and I you remember. you started telling me about donuts. But <laughs> 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 anyway, so, uh, but, but, and I did smoke. Yeah. I did smoke. Uh, and uh, for years, I, I smoked cigarettes and you know, other things, too, but cigarettes is the thing. <laughs> uh, like I say, it's so dramatic, you know what I mean? Let's just tip <laughs> through but, the But the, cigaret, the cigarettes Amen. is the thing. Amen. Because, the, to, to, to your point, I was not measuring up yeah. to other Christians that I would run across because I smoked cigarettes. Yeah. I remember uh, I went to, uh, I, was, I was in church, and uh, Christians from other denominations were there as well, that were in his name only and different things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I prayed for devotion, and, and I had on a velour coat that c collected all the smoke and everything. And a brother came up to me and said, that was a nice prayer that you rendered. You know, that you prayed, all that stuff. Yeah. He said, but you know what, brother? I'm smelling you. <laughs> said, you know, yeah, yeah, in other words, all that prayer that yeah. you did yeah. don't, Move me, yeah, because you smell like because, cigarettes. Yeah, I smell. Yeah, yeah. you know, and yeah. so I would think, yeah, he thought he was better. Yeah, yeah, you know. And and, and when see sister pastor talk to me, I'm saying, okay, listen, okay, we we gonna work through that. <laughs> yeah, yeah we gonna work through that because everybody has an issue. And everybody's saved by the grace of God. Amen. Everybody is saved from something. We're not all saved from the same thing, but we're all delivered from something. Amen. Now, the fact that he was smoking was just going to lead him to an earlier grave. You know what I mean? And, and it was super taboo in the church at that point. It's still not good. Today is not healthy. I tell people right now, stop eating pork. They still eat pork. Amen. It does not mean that you're not going to the kingdom. It just means you're going to get there a little sooner. I mean, let me, let me leave it alone, amen? I'm going to just leave it alone. Okay, all right. All right. Paul is saying we're not saved because of our works, so we can't boast and we can't brag. We can't, we're not saved because of our apparent gifts. We're saved because of the grace of God. Simply because God looked upon you, he looked upon me, and he says, 
I think you're the one I want to use. Isn't that, isn't that something? It's not because we look so good, act so good, we're so smart, did the right things. He just said, I want to use her. I want to use him in Jesus' name. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 11. It says, for God shows no partiality, no arbitrary favoritism. With him, one person is not more important than another. Amen. Isn't that interesting? And so I, told you guys, I want to give honor to God and to the pastor. I Listen, I learned when I had a head full of hair, that's just protocol. Okay. People aren't even thinking about the pastor. It just, you know, it just, just rolls off the lips, you know what I mean? The pastor is in a position to serve the church just like the janitor is in a position to serve the church. If any, either one of us don't do what we're supposed to do, you're going to start smelling some stuff. Amen. Are you with me? You're going you're gonna to smell. Let, me, let the janitor not do what the janitor is supposed to do. And it's going to be real hard for me to preach. Amen. Praise the Lord. Look at what he says in, in Galatians 3.28. Neither is there Jew nor Greek, neither is there slave nor free, neither is there male nor female, for all, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Somebody say, all of us, all of us. are one. In Christ Jesus. And so Paul in Ephesians talks about, number one, the grace of God. Number two, he talks about the fivefold ministry of Jesus Christ. The fivefold, you may have heard that, the fivefold ministry of Jesus Christ. The new church of Jesus Christ needed dedicated and well-equipped leaders to guide them in their new walk. So Ephesians 4.11 puts it like this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Those are five different offices where they come up with the fivefold ministry. Yeah. Now remember, this was the early church. This is the church beginning. It says to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Now, we, most of us, have preferences when it comes to styles of preachers and teachers, right? We have individuals, ooh, he really preached. Well, what did he preach about? Well, that ain't the point. Wait a minute, that is the point. What did he say? You understand what I mean? We have to have a mess. I listen to some folks and I'm thinking to myself, I'm saying they're going to run out of real estate because they're not going to be able to preach like that all their lives and, 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 they, and they really you know, got a lot of hype in it, but it's not a lot of, you know, they don't have enough substance in it. You know what I mean? And then they're going to run out, they're going to run out of real estate. I learned years and years and years ago, I could not, what they call hoop. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And the Lord said, mm -hmm. come unto me all ye that labor mm -hmm. and a heavy later. I'll give you rest. I, I got hoarse every time I tried that. <laughs> I said, leave that stuff alone, man. Just get a word and just give a good word. Hey, Amen. Just give a good word in Jesus' name. Study to show thyself approved unto God. <laughs> hey, Amen. Evangelist has got a word for us. Okay. May I add this? Because yes, ma'am. That sounded good, but you just did to me. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, Sarah, just speaking. You raised my emotion. Okay, okay. You hear me good now. Yeah. But okay. what the Bible said, that merely sound like a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In other words, I didn't get the message that you were delivering yeah. by doing that. You just made me want to jump up. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But the word of God, that that... What God wants us to have is that word that cuts deep yeah. and give me something to live yeah. by, not to just jump, jump on. There I you can go. do that with the BB King. King. Amen. And we did a lot of that too. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. We're not dealing with the style of preaching. We're dealing with the lifestyle of the preacher. You know, what do you bring to the table? Who actually put you at the table? Uh, he or she must speak the truth of Christ in the love of Christ um, and, and be worthy of the calling that they have 
in Christ. Are you with me? And this is something that we have to do intentionally. This doesn't just come to us. Uh, every now and then, you may have a person that just loves the word. Most of us are not there. We have to fight for it. Praise the Lord. We have to fight for it. See, if you want, if you want to uh, eat healthy, you got to fight for it. Because broccoli by itself doesn't taste that good until you eat it repeatedly. And then your taste buds change. Your palate changes. You can eat spinach without, you know, putting in fat back, you know, and all that other stuff that, that kills it. You can, you can eat a salad without drowning it in dressing, which kills the salad. You can eat apples without turning them into apple pie, okay? And, and you will be, okay, let me just go on, okay? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, this mindset is really necessary when it comes to families of Jesus Christ. And so in his way, as he is, before he discusses the arm of God, he speaks about husbands and wives. Okay. Because remember now, he wants the church to be built up. Mm -hmm. The only way the church is going to be built is that families are built. Family. And if the family is shaky, then the church is shaky, even if the church looks like it's going somewhere. Okay. Because we might just be on a B.B. King hype. You know what I'm saying? We just might be. So he talks about husbands and wives. Look at what he says in Ephesians chapter 5, 21 through 24. First of all, he says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Yeah. Submitting to one another out of the reverence of Christ. Then he says in verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Okay, now I'm going to read this. Now don't, I'm reading what's in the Bible. It's in your Bible too, Okay. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Okay. See, you don't get a whole lot of hype out of that. You notice that? You notice that you didn't get no whole, huh, glory. You didn't get a lot of that. Okay. So my question is, women, how do you feel about that? <laughs> you sound quiet. We got thrust down. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. He ain't been trying to give his wife the mic. <laughs> Lord Jesus. <laughs> she got a, wait, a minute. wait a minute. We got a hand up here. Okay, we got one right here. No problem. But praise the Lord, but that's what the word says. See, okay. you read the word, you know, it, that's what it says. Yeah. And we read the Bible just like you yeah. said. But. Yeah. <laughs> For two weeks, you all had me sweating up in this place, man. <laughs> okay. Okay. It is in the Bible. It is in the Bible. Okay. But yes, ma'am. The easier part was not in that verse because you pick a husband that God gives you, then you can submit to him. Okay, no praise problem. the Lord. So now we hear the part Bishop, that's for the wives. Bishop, now let's hear the part for the husbands, okay? I did it three times. The Lord bless me. They eat, eat, no. Uh, <laughs> no. They, eat, they each died. I didn't chase them. Amen. I, they picked me. Praise the, the Lord. Lord told you me. know what? I think, I think this is a subject for another time. <laughs> I'm about to say my time is up. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. Because this is really important. She was saying three times. One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Spirit. Okay. Ephesians. <laughs> okay. Amen. Ephesians 5. Because see, watch this. It, right now, this is, we can laugh. But when you're in the storm, it's not funny. Am I talking to anybody here? I mean, a storm is a storm. Look at what he says in Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, he says, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any such blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
And so now that gives us a whole different perspective. I am not running after somebody based on what I see or based on what I feel, but based on what they bring to the table. Can you imagine if Mary was connected to somebody that was not connected to God like Joseph was? How horrible that situation would have been? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, with all that I ever talk about, uh, you know, the experiences I had growing up outside of Christ and uh, in my journey through mm -hmm. Christ, such as uh, a lot of y'all here. But I will say one thing. This particular scripture, now, I'm going to get a little mushy here. Okay. But, <laughs> okay. Okay. But everything that I ever told Mary, and I, and I, I, I had a, after 50 years of marriage, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going on that. Uh, I, Let's I, give a hand clap for that in <laughs> Jesus' name. Amen. I, I was, I, I'm able to say, yeah. I remember there was a statement I made. I said, did you believe everything that I ever told you? She said, no, I believed in you. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and yeah. That's, the, that's the goal, I think, right there, to believe in Christ. Yeah. And, yeah. And for, even with the smoking thing and yeah. all that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would come home and say things and uh, then go out and uh, like she didn't know. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, but with, with, with that in me that she believed those were the things that helped me overcome yeah. as, as it states in this scripture here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Sister Harm want to speak now, amen. <laughs> <All right. laughs> amen. But because, in, and, and... In the mic, I want to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let me go back. So because of how James has truly loved me, yeah. and I can truly say that, yeah. then it's not hard for me to submit. I think, when, let me go back, I think sometimes for to submit, someone has to love you, yeah. and to show you how much they care, and how to take care of you, and then it's easier to submit, yeah. I believe. Yeah. But if you don't have that love going in, it's harder to submit. It's harder to. It's harder to. And that's the point. So, so when I talk to the men, how do the men see that passage? How do the men see that passage about loving your wife as Christ loved the church? How do the men see about, you know, loving them as you love yourself? How do the men see that? Because, see, watch this. You're dealing with two different individuals that have been wired differently. And so an individual, get this, may not know how to love the way Christ loved the church. Remember, the whole purpose for the teaching was to pre help prepare them to do what they needed to do. I've, I'm coming to the table not understanding what to do, but get this, get this, get this. Don't ever forget this because I, I, I just, I, but I'm trying. Yeah. But but I'm trying, and 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 I and I don't want to fail. But 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 listen, I know I'm failing. I know I'm failing, so do, do, I get the, do I get the submission, or I'm trying to submit, do I get the love, are we working together for a common cause, a common goal, or am I waiting for you to love me like Christ loved the church, and I'm waiting for you to submit to me the way the wife is supposed to submit to me? Can you see how that can be a problem? Can you see how that can be how that can be a problem? Each person has to be connected to him and pray for the other one that the other one gets it while I'm getting it at the same time. Because, we, amen, that's for real, because watch this. We, you do a much better job on your last child than you did on your first child, praise the Lord, because you just didn't know any better. And so I can really relate to what Sister Harden is saying. And, and I know, listen to this, I've talked to Senior AP enough to know that there have been times that he didn't measure up. I know there have been times that I didn't measure up. And I know that if it wasn't for the, for the grace of God and the Marys that he put in our lives, we would not be here today. We would not be standing the way we're standing. Man, because at any moment, they could have wiped us out. Now, you understand? I mean, they could have wiped us out. You all listening to me? We could be number three or four. <laughs> Amen. All right. All right. I'm not going to mess with that anymore. I'm not going to mess. The scripture does say, and I'm going to get this, and I'm going to just do a little bit of this. 
1 Corinthians 6, 14, it says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, but what fellowship have righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? I don't even want to work with that anymore. So watch this. When I was getting married, I knew I had a love for God, and I told you I was struggling with that, but I needed someone who had a love with God, who had a love for God. I had to have somebody. And let me say this to you. I didn't play with that. I did not play with that. If they didn't have a love for God, because I'm talking and I'm serious, because I'm ready to get married. I believe there's a calling on my life. And when they didn't have a love for God, listen, check next. Move on. I'm done. I'm not coming back. I had one young lady. We were talking and talking and talking. And she wanted to go east. I wanted to go west. She wanted to go north. I wanted to go south. One night I took her home and I never came back. Not one more time. Are you listening? She called. I never answered the phone. Never. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done because I'm on a mission. Amen. And I cannot let anybody or anything mess up the calling on my life. And I believe the mission that God has for my life. Amen. All right. All right. Lord Jesus, where am I in this lesson right here? <laughs> okay. Here's this next thing. Because why is it so important that, that couples be together? Because watch this. Because listen to this. When you get angry at somebody, when you get angry at somebody, if it's a person at the church or somebody that you work with, you can kind of get away from them. Can't you? I mean, you can find a way to be busy so you don't have to be around them. But you can't do that with your husband or your wife. Amen. You in this little confined space, praise the Lord, and no space is big enough for you to get away from. They're going to find you. Amen. So the scripture says in Ephesians 4, 26, because we're going to back up one chapter. Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. I hope this mic can hold it every time I drop it. Okay. In your anger. Anybody ever been angry? Okay, anybody ever? Okay, okay I'm gonna, don't raise your hand on this one. Anybody ever been angry, angry with your spouse? In your house? Okay, hands going up anyway. Don't matter. Okay, all right, okay. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let, get this, are you ready for this? Do not let the sun go down while you are what? Angry. Amen. Are you, are you all with me? Missionary White Singer, are you with me right here? Because I, mean, I just want to make sure. <laughs> But, but Bishop, hey man, she's trying but, to be. Go right ahead. But, but the thing about it, I mean, this is from the man's standpoint. Yes, well, ain't nothing wrong. Uh, Did they say that? Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, but what's wrong? Nothing. What you mean, nothing? Yeah. yeah. Why ain't you talking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now we can see how things can can kind of get yeah a little bit interesting there. Here's this is what he says: Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. That's not most of our testimony, am I right? Mm -hmm. But then he says in verse 27: Do not give the devil a foothold. Say that. He says you gotta recognize that's not him. That's the devil. That's not her. That's the devil trying to get in your house, get in your space, yeah. and. Trying to mess up God's plan. Yes, sir. Oh, it's whole glory to God. Can I get three people? I know. Okay, let's go right here. Let's go now to the armor of God. We're going to get out of here. Yes, We're going to do this in the next few minutes. The armor of God. He says in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to take, uh, take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, what I'm going to do, since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to jump to the helmet of salvation. I want to deal with that because it's really one of the last things he mentions, but it's one of the first things that I want to mention. The helmet of salvation. Paul says, guard your head, your thinking, your thoughts, your brain, your mind. Now, let me tell you something about trying. Here's the one thing. My wife was the most wonderful wife. Tomorrow, tomorrow we mark her birthday. And I still celebrate. I go out there once a week to her site. I go to across the street once a week just to let her know I still love her. I'm still thinking she's still a very much alive. Are you with me? Yeah. But watch this. I never allowed any negative thought to come in my mind concerning my wife. Whenever it tried to come into my mind, I knew it was not the work of the Lord. It was the work of the enemy because whosoever findeth a wife findeth a who? Glory to God. You all don't want me to preach this thing up here. Findeth a good thing. Somebody say, I knew I had a good thing and I wasn't going to let him mess up my good thing. You got to watch your thinking. You got to watch your thoughts. You got to watch your brain. You got to watch your mind. The Bible says in Philippians 2 5, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus. So that's why it's so necessary to get the right one when you get the one. 
Am I right? You got to believe that they're going to love on you. You got, And I've talked to Senior AP enough. That's his whole mindset to love his wife and to love his family. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, if I'm going to have the mind of Christ, I have to feed it the things of Christ. And then I got to protect it. I can't talk to people who are going to talk about the good thing that God has given me. I can't talk to people who have a toxic attitude about who I am and how God has blessed me. All right. All right. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right. So I got to watch my mind. Somebody say, watch your mind. Watch your mind. Okay. So if I'm going to watch my mind, I got to watch what I watch. All right. Okay, I got to I got to be careful what I listen to, because if I listen to the wrong thing, I remember and I got to get out. Of it. I remember when I was a kid, I got I got I heard this song that says I got um, uh, two lovers and and I'm not ashamed. I got two lovers and I love them both the same. You know what I mean? And I was thinking I went out and tried to get me two girlfriends. You know what I mean? Trying to follow the song. Then I found out the person was bipolar. It was the same person. You know what I mean? Going both ways. Isn't it crazy? Amen. So I got to, you got to watch what you listen to. Number two, he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Not only must I develop and guard my mind in Christ, but I also must protect my heart in Christ. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. In Christ Jesus. It'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, why wouldn't I allow myself to think anything negative about my wife? Because my wife had to deal with me. And I had to admit, I was a handful in Jesus. I still a handful. You with me? And, and watch this. And if she put up with me, Lord Jesus, I, it's shame on me if I'm not going to just give her everything she could, she could ever seem to want. All right, let's keep on. This breastplate, I got to guard my, I got to guard my heart. And now, now, now he talks about gird up your loins with the truth. Okay. Now, now watch this because in Ephesians chapter six fourteen. In the, new, in the New International Version, Paul says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. That's the New International Version. But the belt of truth around your waist is not how it's mentioned in the King James Version. It's called girt your loins with truth. Okay. All right. It says, stand fast, therefore, having your loins girded about with the truth. There's a big difference between your, ra- what your waist and your loins. The waist, watch this, is where your belt rests. Your loins are beneath that part. Okay? Your loins deals with your sexuality. The loins are sexual organs found beneath the waist. Paul says your loins need to be covered or wrapped with truth. Last week we talked about Samson. Samson was strong in his body, wasn't he? But he was weak in his loins. We talked about David, a man after God's own heart, but he was weak in his loins. Look at Joseph because it can be done. When Potiphar's wife came to Joseph and said, lie with me, lie with me. It's just us here. Just lie with me. The Bible says that he refused. Look at Genesis 39 verse 8. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself about anything in this house. Everything he owns, he's trusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Now, then how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Why is that? Because not only was his mind wrapped in God, not only was his heart wrapped in God, but his loins were wrapped in God as well. I am not going to deviate from the God that has saved me. Ephesians chapter 7, look at the thing. He says, put your feet. Feet should be fitted with the gospel of peace. Your feet should be fitted with the gospel of peace. In other words, my feet are designed to take me to places and spaces where God leads me. 
I'm not going anywhere else. Come on, you all stand with me? I'm not tipping. I'm not dipping. I'm not slipping. I know where I'm going, and God is going to get glory out of where I am. Psalm chapter 1, verse Psalm 1 and 1, this is what it says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate night and day. Now I got the shield of faith. Because you see, the shield uh, is what blocks the attacks of fear yes, sir. and anxiety and panic. And watch this. And even the desire for better. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I don't have to deal with this. I can have better. Yeah, you can. But you can have worse, too. All right. I need to talk to God and I only need to go where God tells me I should go. And anything that comes against me, I use the shield of faith to block it. OK, because without faith, it's impossible for me to please God. For if any man comes to God, he must believe that he is, that he exists and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. So I got to block the attacks. Amen. I got to block the attack. Somebody's trying to hit on me. I got to block the attacks. Okay. Somebody's trying to pull me away from what God has given me. I got to block the attack. Somebody is trying to convince me to do something that I know I'm not supposed to do. I got to block. Come on, work with me. Something. Okay. I got to block the attack. The, the devil wants me to spend something that I know I'm not supposed to spend. I don't have it to spend. It's not even mine to spend. I got to, somebody say block the attacks. I got to block the attacks. I got to block. I'm not going to enable people just because they're my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife my brother my sister I cannot I gotta go where God wants me to go and I'll use the shield of faith to block yes. last one the sword of the spirit yes. the sword of the spirit is the word of God now listen to this all the men I'm sweating up a storm in this way man all of the other parts of of the armor were designed for defense yes, sir. until you get to the sword of the spirit yes, are you with me the bible says in psalm 119 11 thy word have i hid in my heart that i might not sin against thee you see the spirit is the sword is not only for defense but it's also for offense i'm gonna block you if i'm gonna use my shield and i'm gonna use the sword to block your attack but if you get too close to me and if it looks like you're trying to take me out of here i'm gonna use this sword and i'm gonna cut you are you all staying with me i'm gonna use this word when jesus went into the wilderness in matthew 4 the only weapon he had was the word of god the only weapon he needed was the word of god that holds true for you and me today the bible says in psalm 107 verse 20 he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all of their destructions saints of god put on the whole armor of god and stand strong in the power of his might. Woo! I'm done. Hallelujah. 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 Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him glory. We do have a trivia. <laughs> I'm going to give that to you. The Bible says that Saul initially ch- attacked the people of the church. Describe when and how he was saved. We all have a story. I want you to go and find Saul's story. We tiptoed around it today. I'm giving you a hint. It's not far from what we talked about. Just give the description. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this time together with you and with each other. I thank you for the richness of your word. I thank you that we're saved and we're safe and we're sealed throughout eternity. Some of the things are a little interesting to us. Some are even a little harsh, but they're all designed that we might be built up and be a greater family in your name. In Jesus' name, we we say thank you. Amen. Bless God. Hallelujah. All right. Everybody hug somebody and let them know you love them with Jesus' love.